Yeah. All right, everybody, welcome. Thanks for joining. My name's Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Uh, tonight, we're excited to host anti-racist organizer Josh Fernandez for discussion of his new book, uh, The Hands That Crafted the Bomb, uh, a biography born out of the experience he had under investigation for soliciting students for potentially dangerous activities after starting an anti-fascist club on the campus that he taught on. Uh, Josh is joined tonight by fellow memoirist, Joe Loya. So uh, in case this is the first event you're joining with us, uh, Firestorm is an almost 16 year old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. We strive to feature books and events that uh, reflect our own interests as well as the needs of marginalized communities in the South. And we're continuing to do uh, some of our events uh, online like this, both because uh, it gives us opportunities to connect with authors and, um, and attendees who we wouldn't otherwise, and also because even in our own local community, we know there's folks for whom uh, the pandemic continues to be a barrier to participation. So if you're interested in keeping up with us for future events, you can follow us on social media. Uh, and I'll share a link to our newsletter and website stuff uh, in the chat in a minute. So as we were kind of saying a moment ago, we are using Zoom's uh, webinar tonight, um, which has some quirks. Uh, we would love uh, comments and questions from the audience, which you can submit using the Q&A tool. I think it's probably at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and if you want just as we go, please feel free to type out those questions and we're going to have space at the end where we circle back and uh, and answer as many of those as possible, but it's great to get them queued up early. So we're going to get started here. Josh Fernandez is an anti-racist organizer, a father, a runner, a fighter, an English professor, and a writer whose stories uh, have appeared in Spin, The Sacramento Bee, Hard Times, and several other uh, news weeklies. He lives in Sacramento, California. Joe Loya is an essayist, TV writer, podcaster, and author of the acclaimed memoir, The Man Who Outgrew His Prison uh, Cell, which is available from his website. I'll put a link in the chat for that so you can grab a copy. Uh, he co-hosted the podcast Bank Robber Diaries in 2019. Definitely check it out. And he's currently completing another memoir, producing a podcast on prison life and selling a TV show about a family of bank robbers, a busy man. Thanks for taking <laughs> time out of your schedule to join us, Joe. Really appreciate it. Of course. Of course. Um, and yeah, just to plug this book before I pass off y'all, if you haven't already picked it up, definitely grab it. It is the kind of book that you're going to crack it open on a Saturday morning and it's going to eat your whole weekend. Um, Cause you won't be able to put it down. It's sharp. It's raw. It's actually surprisingly funny. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think folks are going to really enjoy it if they haven't already. I'm going to pass it off to you, Josh, so you can share a little bit about it. Thank you. Can Let me just start with an announcement. If uh, uh, the Firestorm sweatshirts, they run a little bit small. So if you're going to order a Firestorm sweatshirt, you might want to size up. Thank you. <laughs> An important <laughs> announcement, but I will say we do stock up to 5X. So okay, that's we got good. you covered on the larger yeah. sizes. Exactly. My my activism knows no bounds. I just <laughs> anyone could get it. Uh, yeah. So so I think I'm just gonna start um, first. I just want to say thanks to to um, Liberty and Joe, uh, Joe for being here. Uh, it it was really cool. The the way I met Joe was I watched a documentary called Protagonist. That was that's what it was called. Joe, right? Yep, that's it. Yeah, and and um it was such a good documentary and, and Joe was one of the, I think there were three people whose stories um, were told and, uh, and Joe told his story and it was so funny, but it was also so like heart wrenching um, and interesting that I, I pulled like a stalker move and I had to find, <laughs> I, I tracked him down on the internet and, and luckily he was so gracious. He gave me his phone number and we talked right away. Uh, and we've been friends since. So yeah, yeah, it was really cool. Uh it was really cool. And I, I read his his memoir uh very quickly. So if you haven't gotten his memoir, it's so good. It's really good. And, and that was one of the reasons I I wrote my my memoir was uh 
because uh, he inspired me so much. So um, I'm going to just read a little passage from this book. And uh, and then we're going to we're going to have a conversation. So this is a path passage from sort of the end -ish of the book. And it's called uh, going to prison. So uh, the book is basically framed around my job at Folsom Lake College trying to fire me for helping the students start an anti fascist club. Um, and as I'm looking at some of the uh, the participants here in this chat, uh, some of them were actually in that club who are who are on this call right now. So um, and they helped me get out of that situation. So thank you. Um, but anyway, so it's kind of framed around that. And so uh, this is from a chapter where I take this opportunity from my school to go teach inside of a prison, which I'm still doing to this day. Um, and so so this is uh, from one of my first times in the prison. Uh, the classrooms are tucked in the corner of the overpacked sea yard. The first time I walk in, one of the inmates, a leader of the Nazi lowriders, gasps and says, you look like one of us, which is the first time anyone has said that to me. When I walk into meetings on my campus, administrators shuffle papers, clear their throats, and barely manage to fake their smiles. Kel, the small tattooed man at the back of the classroom, is sitting still, but vibrates with energy. As if at any moment, smoke will pour from his ears, his ass will light on fire and a lift into the atmosphere like a model rocket. He looks like every Nazi skinhead I've ever fought or bought drugs from during my childhood. The little soul patch under his smirking bottom lip, the bald head shining like an evil sun and the dim glow of madness twinkling in his crystal blue eyes. He scares me the way many people have scared me throughout my life. Not because he's mean or angry, he's quite the opposite, always jovial, smiling, and raising his hand to answer a question, but because underneath his enthusiastic personality, something sinister can surface at any moment. It's not something everyone possesses, but it's a trait that I can see in others, and especially in myself. I'm not sure what to think about everyone else, like Jeremy, a member of the Aryan Nations gang who has murdered people outside of the prison as well as inside. He's a straight-A student who lifted his shirt on my first day to show me his gigantic swastika tattoo. There's James, a carjacker and polite dark-skinned man with braids, who uses words like unequivocally in casual conversation, and Jerry, <laughs> 80-something-year-old Silicon Valley marketing executive, who, along with his wife, adopted Russian children and molested them. And of course, there's Ricky, the lunk-headed former MMA fighter who laughs at all my jokes. On my first day, I told them that the only rule in this class is you're, is you're not allowed to stab me to death. And he's been my pal ever since. He sits right up front and center. You're my spirit animal, he declared, which made me feel good until I made the mistake of typing his name into Google to learn what he'd landed him in prison. One night, he and his sparring partner drank mushroom tea and became entangled in a paranoid drug-hazed fantasy war between God and the devil. As the night wore on, he attacked his friend, dismembered him, and removed his still-beating heart, which the police found cooking on the stovetop when they arrived. But Ricky's right. I'm his spirit animal. We're all spirit animals, all of us, everywhere. Not in the yoga mom going to pick up her kids from soccer practice sense. We're spirit animals in the same sense as the Ojibwe people would say ode or heart. We're all of the same heart. From the depraved and sick lowlife slithering in the world's sewage to the weasel-faced warden in his Sears suit two sizes too big, all connected uh, by the make of our flimsy skin and the murky air we breathe. That's why I love working in this horrible and cold place, crawling with cops and murderers and molesters. There's heart here in this prison, a different kind of heart, the kind that's been born out of desperation. When a good thing happens in prison, this heart beats loud against its miserable backdrop. Kel is waving his hand like a victory flag. Can you come read this, he says, slightly embarrassed. He pulled me aside early in the class to tell me he wasn't used to a classroom full of students, that he didn't know how to act in an educational setting. I said not to worry that none of us know how to act and that we're all pretending anyway. He laughed, but I wasn't kidding. I walked through the row of desks and the inmates working on the paragraphs I instructed them to write, 
Start with a bold sentence to outline their idea, write an explanation adding to the idea, then get specific with some evidence, then write about the evidence in your own words, then wrap it up. Think of the paragraph as the home where your idea lives, I say. The more we look into the home, the more we understand the idea. The class musters a mass look of confusion. What did your childhood home look like, I asked the class. Petro raises his hand. It looked like shit, he says. The class laughs. Why? It was a trailer, he says, not a house. If I walked in, what kind of stuff would I find? Drugs? What kind? All of them. Was there anything good in there? Food, he says, closing his eyes. We always had good food. You described the trailer as shitty, but it wasn't all shitty. There was good food in there, right? Yeah, I guess. So that's the complexity of something that is labeled shitty. It's not all shitty. There can be good shit, too. The class laughs again. I'm not following, Petro says. If I want to examine your personality, I can look into your childhood home. I'd find a lot of shitty stuff, some good stuff, and some boring shit, too. Yep. So your childhood home is one piece of you, I say. Examining that place is a good way of finding out who you are. But is that everything? No. What if I looked into your home right now? My cell? Your cell, I repeat. Another paragraph. Does that tell me anything about you? That I'm a fucking degenerate? The class laughs. Is that all you are? That's how they see me, he says, pointing to the outside. I tell the class that when we step inside a paragraph, we see what's in there and who lives there by examining its sentences and evidence. Each paragraph is its own house. Each set of houses is a neighborhood or an essay. Some are gated communities, some are slums, and some are prisons. Kell's handwriting is messy, but I can still make it out. He's written about his youth, the tragic cycle of drugs and fighting and neglect, punctuated intermittently by his grandfather, the only person who showed care toward him. He wrote about hugging his grandma and the feeling of warmth he received from the embrace. The essay is an acutely self-aware argument about what it takes to end up in a penitentiary and how it can be avoided. It's better than anything I've ever read from any other student. I have to fight back tears while reading. His paragraphs are structured. Each one is its own house, including this one, a filthy squat, a dim, piss-soaked shithole filled with rats and drugs, but one that produces a desperate and soulful art. It's perfect. You got it, I say, raising my shoulders, signaling that I have nothing else to say. Really, he says, looking confused, as if nobody has ever told him that. Do you have any advice? Keep doing it, I said. I head back toward the front of the classroom. I can feel his smile burning my back all the way there. This is not uncommon in prison. The human mind's uncaged brilliance, the unrefined writing skill, and the ability to weave a story onto a page. It seems like a waste to lock this up in the middle of the California farmland. One day after class, Kel tells me he's getting out in August, which is only a few months away. Try not to murder anyone in the meantime, I joke. No promises, he says, shrugging. I've never seen him so excited. He's getting an A in the class. He's helping the other students who don't understand the concepts. He's writing brilliant arguments and defending them with evidence. I have hope for him. I tell him to look me up when he gets out so we can grab a meal and see some black metal shows. He nods and says, fuck yes. I'm trying to get some grading done a couple weeks later at my desk when I type Kel's name into my Google search bar to see if anything comes up. An Instagram page with Kel wearing a fedora. His bio says he's looking for porn. His eyes glazed with a meth stare. A picture of his mugshot pops up. Then a photo still from a surveillance video camera on a bus. It's fuzzy, but I can make out his face. He looks angry. His features distorted like a demon. And he's clutching something in his hand. I click on the image and an article pops up. Kel was released and made his way to Colorado. In Leadville, he was on a public bus when he got into an altercation. He attacked another passenger from behind with a knife and tried to kill him. I read some of the comments. He looks like a psycho. What a piece of shit, a thug, a nightmare. Lock him away forever. If, I only, if they only knew what I knew. I open my email and find a message from a student on the main campus, a rich girl who's constantly a pain in the ass. She complains about everything in the classroom, the lighting, the books, the essays we read, the other students. She's angry about her grade and it explains that she can't have less than an A because she needs to get into a nice college. She hasn't turned anything in, no homework, no essays. I imagine she grew up in Folsom in the hills where the mansions overlook the valley below. 
her parents are probably doctors or lawyers, or maybe they're marketing executives like Jerry, the molester. She's probably not used to hearing the word no. I want to tell her to fuck off that I know a neo-Nazi serial murderer who's managed to turn in all his assignments. But instead, I send a message that says she can make up any work she wants and still get an A, that it's going to take some work. She says she's going to write on the internet about me and tell the dean that I'm a horrible teacher, which I encourage. Get on rate my professor. Go to the dean. Use whatever power you have to do whatever you're going to do. It doesn't fucking matter. It's after 3 a.m. and I am lost in a YouTube vortex watching video after video of fist fights in the street. I know I should be sleeping, but I can't. I'm too caught up in watching other people make horrible mistakes. I open a YouTube video of a civilian getting arrested for pretending to be a cop. He drives around on a motorcycle, pulling people over, yelling at them to comply. I'm fascinated by these videos. I watch them until the early morning, hours of footage of fake cops being confronted by real cops. Of all the things to pretend to be, why a cop? Why not a firefighter or a mermaid? People never cease to amaze me. Their brilliance, their mind boggling idiocy, their pathetic desperation. I understand I'm all of these things too. Some see me as a good man, so I remind them that I am not. Some see me as evil, so I show them why they are wrong. I am the sum of my life, little hands tinkering away to make me better, my own hands fixing their work as I go. Man, that's so good. That's one of my favorite. That's one of my favorite parts. <clears throat> you know, when I was um, when I was reading this, I would I would read sections like that, and I think that's one of the sections I sent um, to friends. I would just take photos of it, like, look at the read this, read this. You need to get this book. You need to get this book. Or think, I was encouraging friends of mine who 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 want to write, and I and I know they have a voice. They're, they're rowdy inside. They're rambunctious, and they're. And their ideas, whenever they send me writing, is so rich, but they can't think of how they're going to be able to construct a full narrative out of it. And I'm I'm using this as like, you just need to write stories and then you can link them together and put the little connective tissue between them. But I'm, yes. it's just going to be super helpful for that, for me, for, for that kind of work, because um, I want to encourage as many people to do this. I feel like your voice, okay, this took me four hours to read. I went like that, like this, I got in it. And I was in it. It the, the um, it was fat. It has a great fucking pace. Like your wit, your 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 um, the stories you tell, the way they're crafted. It's just such a well written book. It's so fast. Um, that has the energy of of your mind. You know, it's just kind of the the wildness of you. I'm gonna get into ask you some questions about it. But I first want to say that I totally loved it. I love the honesty. It reminded me of a quote. Um, <clears throat> of my, it's like one of my favorite quotes. And I measure writers who write about serious things, especially who write about violence and rage, or write about the traumas that you experienced growing up, or traumas like I experienced. And it's by um, Flannery O'Connor. She says, the maximum amount of seriousness admits the maximum amount of comedy. And your dark humor is on point, oh boy. It's on fucking point. Like, it's as good as it gets. It's as rich as anything I really love in prison. I mean, I I love writing that that does that, can swing from once one pole to the next. And the humor is, the humor is, is what makes it so powerful. The humanity um, of, of uh, that you draw us into. You know, it's also the rage. I mean, the thing about this book is you really, you know, the title is The Hands of Crap and Bomb, The, the Making, for lifelong anti-fascists, like we see how your humor ends up being a, a, a tool for you, you know, like yeah. the way you look at the world, the way you frame the world, that kind of thing. Absolutely. I want to say that, I don't know if you're familiar with Oscar Zeta Acosta. Do you know the Brown Buffalo? No, no, no. You read the Brown Buffalo. Brown Buffalo is a Mexican, is a Chicano activist, um, like um, the Ruben Salazar era during the Chicano movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And good friends with Hunter Thompson, and they and and they ran together. In fact, Benito um, del Toro played the Oscar uh, Acosta Zeta Acosta character in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Like uh, they were two dogs, they ran together. But Oscar was wild. I mean, he was like he was doing the drugs. He was hallucinating. He was crazy um, by by all accounts. And he wrote these great books. One's the autobiography of the Brown Buffalo, or whatever. Like this has that energy. It's like 
the Hunter Thompson entered that that energy really fucking good more than Bukowski, but that's in here. All right, so I loved it. I I want everyone to get it. I'm going to be promoting the hell out of it even further for after this. But I have some questions. Let's get into it. Yeah. Um, so also there was all this. There was all these places where I read it and I was like, shit, that was in my story. That like we share so many experiences. And the first one that comes up very early is your. Um, relationship to teachers you 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 hated teachers yes all through from the very fucking from kindergarten yeah and, and your detailed your detailed antagonisms with them was really fascinating it was important to to see it all the way through the way it, what, what was your thinking at well for obviously you're a professor now what was your thinking as you started going into this book how were you was that part of the the skeleton of this you wanted to follow the track all the teachers that you kind of fucking hated along the way was that was that i mean if i tracked all of them it would just be an entire book about teachers i hated <laughs> so like yeah i mean i definitely had to get the first one because i was like you know kindergartens i look at my kids and i'm like they're in kindergarten and they love kindergarten because it was easy and like they played and their teacher was cool do you know what i mean yeah like mine, my daughter too yeah, yeah mine was an asshole so i was like that like really set the tone for me. Do you know what I'm saying? And like when I first started reading, uh, writing this book, it was all, it was 100% rage and it looked nothing like it looks now because um, I just wanted to get it out. Like I, I'm the kind of person and tell me if you're the same kind, but like I have a lot of rage inside of me. And, and like I used to try to try to like push it away or like pretend I was someone who wasn't full of rage or like, um and so like one thing i learned is like i need to get it out i just i'm just a rageful person and i need to get it out so the first draft of this book was just fire it was just fiery rage and like no one would read it there was no humor there was no there was no nothing it was just like i gotta get this out it was like stabbing you know what i mean like no one wants to see a movie just an hour no, and did you, rage, rage expressed pure rage expressed it becomes totally cliche Oh, I just exactly. want to bomb and I better blow up everyone. Fuck you. It's 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 not interesting. It becomes flat. And yeah. you, this is what activates the rage and makes it interesting is when you have all these other rich emotions and counter out acting, all that stuff. Give me go on. Yeah, no, and, and that that was it. So like um but I did have like throughout consistently throughout my childhood, I had so many shitty teachers, and like I don't think I had one good teacher all through you know kindergarten and high school it wasn't until community college where i had a good teacher who was like oh you're worth something and so like that that was a formative experience for me it was like public ed education my view of it was like no this is like prison basically yeah i think that i think that social yeah some of us don't do well with socialization socialization is a thing you go to school and they tell you sit here get there play well with others and stuff and and if things are going well and we buy into it then that's cool when things start going funky at home or things start weird and and we we don't feel like every other kid we realize every other kid has an easier falling into the line because it's that's that's what society allows and and, and privileges and, and and benefits people who kind of like their lives are not too, you know too well. Mine was whoop 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 all over the place. I couldn't find the steady line, the through line through school. So even though I was intelligent, like you were intelligent, it was hard to focus. It was hard to, and then I could focus to special interest subjects, and then everything else was boring. Fuck you, I'm uninterested. And then the socialization, the pressures to try to be like that, I would I would. I resisted them like, nope, nope. You eventually got me, you know, to, to try and kill my dad and go to prison and all these other crazy things because I was being beaten. I was like, fuck you. But that's, you track that, how you were bumping up against socialization being like, nope, no, nope, very early, earlier than me even. But, but it's, but that's what you do tracking these stories. And also what's cool is you give us the beginning, some very powerful stuff about the, um, but your schooling and who you were. And then as you go through life, you keep saying like that box in that teacher's room, like that, like you keep going back yeah. and then you could see how it was so impactful in your life. Like a lot of people who read this book are going to be like, yeah, when I was younger, there was this, this situation. Same with me. I had, I had, I had my teacher, one of my teachers come back to me that traumatized me in junior high. 
Um, yeah. in, in elementary school when my mother was dying. Mm. He saw me when my my book was came out. I was on Bill Riley's show. And this guy was now a Christian. He is, you know, he was a Christian. I was in a Christian school. And he reached out, oh, Joe, I don't know if you remember me. Da, 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 I missed, I'm Mr. Latrell. And I'm like, oh, I remember you. <laughs> I said, I'm proud of you. And I said, hey, you're in my book, man. You should. And in the book, it was, I, I, I talked about when I was in solitary confinement, how I fantasized how I would injure him now for all the trauma <laughs> that he created in me. And I never heard back from him. But uh, I mean, you, like you and I. you read it. Do you think he read it? I absolutely read it. Absolutely read it. And and it was like, oh, no, don't want to go there. I also think what was really brilliant, talk a little bit, if you can, for people here. There's this moment at the beginning of the book, and I felt like, okay, I'm going to be able to, I'm going to be able to keep, I'm, I knew that you were going to keep referring to this thing too, the upside down, that mm -hmm. thing with you. And when I start, when I read this thing and I describe it to, to the viewers, uh, to the audience, um, but tell me about how, like I wonder as I was reading it, I was like, was this dude autistic? Was he got was are were you neurodivergent? Were you on the spectrum a little bit? I there's no way to know because I was, you know, I don't know if they were even do, thinking about that stuff like that. But describe that whole that whole thing you did. The yeah, it was weird. Just I I just remember um like being really comfortable sitting on my head. And I would love to watch TV sitting on my head. And how like, old were you when you started? I forget. I, think I must have been. I must have been set six or seven. Se yeah, maybe around six or seven. But um, yeah, I don't. It was just this thing I like to do. And I, I always felt different. Like I always felt odd or like I didn't feel as social as other people or like I felt really um, analytical when I was younger. Like I would just watch people and be like, it's almost like people watch um, zoo animals. Do you know what I mean? I'd be like studying people and being like, so like there's there was part of me that was just I was so busy watching people that it was hard for me to like jump in and be like, hey, um, especially when I saw other people interacting so well. Do you know what I mean? And like when I was sitting on my head, I'm like it was almost a physical representation of how I felt inside. <laughs> like I just you're just upside down. I was just upside down. My upside face down. would be bright red. My veins would be popping out. I'd fall asleep like that, fall over, get back up. It was weird. And in the in the in the in the in the grocery store, what would you do? Yeah, 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 yeah. You just sit sit on my head in the cart, looking at all the cans, the the uh, the items, and like, you know, that didn't work too well. Oh, but but yeah, wild. I you loved it. I walked, just, like tried to see the world upside down. Yeah, and I think I got it in my head that I could just live my life like that. Do you know what I mean? Upside down. That's so well, but I think that that's important for us. To like, there's all these moments in the beginning. That's what I love about this book. You set it up like, okay, look at. I was already peculiar. I was I was going to have a peculiar relation with the world because I um I receive pulsations from the world differently than other other kids, and I do shit like stand on my head and or you know and you know watching TV, uh, you know in the in the cart at the supermarket. Like that was a way to view the world through that upside down lens, which you then track throughout. And which I found was very interesting. Um, so as a memoirist, and I, you know, I wrote, I wrote the story. I look at it like whoever I write about, my life is going this way, and our lives intersected, and I'm going to write about my side of the intersection. Mm -hmm. If you don't like when I write about my contact with you, that's cool. Go and write about your contact with me, like that moment. But I own my narrative all the way through the contact and all the way through it. So like, that's on me. I own that narrative. You can own your part of it and it might be diametrically opposed to my perception of it, but I'm going to, I have no, I don't need anyone's permission to write my story and my contact with them. A lot of people who, even people I'm, who I'm helping with write their story now, they're concerned about offending their family. Yeah. Bringing family into it. Right. And so they're like, I don't, and I always tell them, Hey, listen, fuck, fuck worrying about what you're going to say about your family or people just write it first. And then you can see the discomfort you have, but at least get your story to own your story on the page. It'll help you work through shit. You'll discover things about yourself. And even if that's the only thing that comes from it, that's still super helpful. Um, and then we can work on how much you want to tell, what you don't want to tell. Maybe you have to confront people and say, hey, you know, I'm going to do this. What do you think? But people are really scared to write about things that might offend their other, uh, other people in their family. So I was wondering, 
Um, did you confront that barrier and how did you, was that a barrier in the, initially and how did you overcome it or was, yeah, tell me your relationship to that. No, um, I didn't, I didn't really, uh, I feel like I was born to be offensive in a certain way. So like, I kind of, I kind of didn't think about it really. I was like, I'm a, I'm a writer. I'm just going to write. That's how I, that's how I think about things. Do you know what I mean? It's like, that's cool. Uh, I, I'm a writer. I'm just going to write. And um, there were things like with my family, like with my wife that I took out. Um, I just, it's such a, a, like, it's such an explosive narrative that I didn't want her to be anywhere near the impact. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? So like much collateral damage. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was think I, I thought about that during my drafts and, and, you know, I took a lot of stuff out, but um uh yeah but but stuff with like my work like they they tried to fire me for starting an anti-fascist club with the students and right. like, that was wrong <laughs> it was just wrong and like in the documentation um of the investigation it says they were wrong right so like i i deserve something it's not like i won money or anything i just got to keep my job there that's it um and so like i deserve i'm a writer what do they think i'm gonna do do you know oh, yeah. I, didn't think, did you, I didn't think that you would be worried about offending them i felt like you would actually relish that yeah uh, I do. but i'm thinking more like in terms of your stepdad and your dad your mom you know, you know I, and not like you said anything bad about them but i would just like that's where people are afraid like they think or you know in your case yeah with, yeah i mean life. in a sense i'm lucky because they stopped talking to me way beforehand <laughs> so, so like yeah they, they haven't talked to me in a long in years so so uh um, oh, okay well that's interesting my dad when i got out of prison and and i told him i was going to start writing this book he was like he pulled me over one day and he was like you know by the way i'm gonna let you know that i, I give you permission to write about me i was like i don't need your permission man. i said thank yeah. you but no i don't need it i'm gonna write what i'm gonna write and i gave him my whole spiel about i own my side of it and even when the book came out he he felt he took some offense at some of the things I'd written. I was like, cool, dude, go and write, go and write your memoir of what it was like to be our dad in that time. That's cool. And and, yeah. and you, could, you could, you could argue with me all day long. Um, Definitely. Hey, d here's my question is, is when you, when you wrote your memoir, did you feel um, like I felt when I finished, I'm like, I think everyone should write a memoir. I feel yeah. like it made me stronger. It made me stronger. It made me understand myself more it made me understand like my fight, my struggle, um, everything. It sort of like crystallized. Is it, did you feel that at all? Yeah, I tell when I was writing, I had an, a, a, a uh, correspondence with the essayist Richard Rodriguez when I was in prison, mm -hmm. and I told him that I was as I started writing my memoir the last the last three and a half years, the last two and a half years of my sentence. I did seven and a half years, uh, seven years, and um, so. I told him that what was happening, what I was discovering was that when I when I would tell stories about my life, I would be able to like say, oh, I started I started this real weird relation with money at this stage in my life. Or I started, you know, like I could track, I could tell you when things happen. But when I actually sat down and had to write the stories and put them in order, I found out like, oh shit, I started having money issues way earlier i started having issues with these things earlier like it was important for me to when i put it down and 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 write about feelings i had memories i had i could organize my narrative on the page and organizing it one it told me more truth about myself like yeah. oh i thought i was i thought i was having money problems when i started stealing from my dad's the offering from the church he had, I started stealing when I was, you know, eighth grade. It turns out I had money. I was showing some obsession with money way before that. Yeah. So like, and if, if I'm going to be a bank robber, I want to talk about when did money start becoming like, oh, I got to have it like that thing. So it was important to track my relationship to money. Um, so a lot of those things happen, like d tracking the rage, rage element. You know, when did that come up? I thought it came up at a certain time. I found out it was earlier. So I feel like it's important to write our stories if nothing else, because we reveal so much about ourselves. Because before that, there are these like there's these like discrete stories running around in our head, and periodically something happens, and we pull it down, we get really mad about it, and then we let it go, and then we just always pull these stories 
that are all around. But when you plant them on the page and you start interlocking them, this thing happened, then this thing happened, then this thing happened, you could track them better and you could start, you can explore them and you can go deeper into them. But you have to first lay them out so yeah. that they're not just these sort of discrete things just wandering around your head and triggering you and then being gone. You get, yeah. to, you get to put them on the page and then you can own your story. That's what I would tell people. Like when I was, when I would write my letters to, to Richard, I was using that phrase on your story. So yes. And I help so many people. I encourage people to write it. And then I give them some, I give them some tips um, how to do that, but we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, another interesting point in which our stories relate is when the FBI came to arrest me, the second time, because when I was first arrested, um, I, they said I robbed 25 banks and then they put let me go on bail and I robbed five more. And so they went to go arrest me while I was on bail. And um, when they finally arrested me at UCLA and when these two young FBI agents came at me, they're like, Joe, Joe Lloyd, I was reading the newspaper, just chilling there, waiting for my girlfriend to walk by. I was going to give her money and then I was going to go to Mexico. But she snitched on me, so now the FBI is looking for me all over the campus. These two, uh, I, I hear Joe, Joe Loy, and I look, and I don't recognize them. No, oh, that's you, Joe, Joe. And I'm like, oh, fuck, it's that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm caught. And they come to get me. They thought they were just going to, like, boo, you know, scare me in the handcuffs. Yeah. And I jump up when one of them grabs me by the back of my, and I just start fighting. Boom, I go at him. And the fight happens, and then the students, they're like, help us, he's a bank robber. And the students jumped on me. And that's <laughs> what they arrested. It was terrible, man. It was so humiliating. But I fought the FBI when they came to get me. And yes. that same, I was hoping maybe you would even read that story. Tell me about that story, man. Tell a little bit, tell us a little bit about that story. I mean, it's crazy. It's like when my when my mom and my dad divorced, he took us to he basically kidnapped us. He, you know, he said he was gonna take us there for a week to Samoa, but he ended up keeping us. And so my my mom, uh and my my mom got married while while we were gone and so my mom and my stepdad had to like deal with the uh fbi to try to get us back and um so when um uh, when it finally came my dad like leans into us and he's like and how old are you guys you and your sister i think i was um five and my sister was maybe eight or maybe yeah something around there okay so go on and then um yeah he just leans and he's like you got to kick him He's like, get on my shoulders. You're going to kick them. And so like they came, I, I just remember them coming through the fog and we're like, okay, here it is. Here we go. And like, I just remember my little feet kicking and like, it wasn't a, it wasn't like a badass fight or anything, but. <laughs> yeah. I tend to kick your grandma. Yeah. And I kicked my grandma in the face. It was all bad, but you know. <laughs> So I was like, I was reading that. I was like, oh, so we both have like fighting FBI. Well, yeah. Arrest them. <laughs> yeah, that was, you know, but here's the thing. I mean, we're laughing about it, but that, um, there was, your dad was such a tragic, tragic character, which brings me to another point. One of the interesting things about this, this is how you avoid, I mean, your dad was schizophrenic. He was, yeah. he had schizophrenia, that's it. And so, all his stuff could be understood through the, you know, through the disease or through the condition, affliction, whatever. But never in your, and never in trying to understand you and your behaviors and your wildness, is there any pathologizing of like mental disorder? Never. You say you're an addict and you describe everything through the lens of an addict. But none of the the wild swing panic. You say you have a panic attack, but there's never like I'm bipolar. I'm like I might like not like. You describe what could, could be perceived as you know years of depression. Yeah. You don't say you're chronically depressed. You don't have you know, like you haven't diagnosed. There's no diagnosis throughout here. I was wondering because I feel like people would have done something with that in this day and age to pathologize behavior, and it seemed like you were almost meticulous. In not doing that, the only person who we understand to be mentally ill in the entire story was your dad with the schizophrenia. What was that? A, was that a choice, or was that just how you look at the world? You don't. That's not how you think. Or what? what talk about that. Yeah, you, I mean, part of part of the narrative is just about like um, trying to figure out how I became this rageful person, right? And like, I think just slapping a label on it would have would have killed the book right right away to be honest crazy good and good like, true 
you know what I mean? And so like, and it's not that simple for me. And I, you know, obviously other people have different ways of doing things, but for me, I feel like, um, you know, th this narrative that is my life is, is just made up of all of these different parts and these weird rusted parts and like very modern parts and very old parts. And, um, you can't just look at one and then fix it and then expect everything to be okay. It's like this delicate thing that was crafted and in, in such a way that it's, um, that it's volatile. Do you know what I mean? And, and, I, uh, and I love that because I feel like then where you're able to explore and unpack these stories without feeling that you have to put some sort of psychological, you know, spin on it. I feel like labels if you had labeled yourself any of those things, you're trying to say, try and understand this through through this label of psychological affliction, whatever our mental mental um, mental illness um, rubric. I feel like that would have flattened your stories. It would have made them narrow, cliche in some ways. And I feel like what you've done is you've written a story that shows like all the complexities alive. And I feel like it's one of these like. That that Yates poem where he talks about a terrible beauty being born. Yeah, like, it's like it's like we're watching you like you know almost like that trans transformation a horror movie where yeah like, something jumps out of somebody's stomach and it's like and it's you don't know what it's gonna be yet but it's it's misshapen but it's 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 it's, it's viscera it's like it just I feel like you're the, your exploration of that like the story you wrote there about the reading us about the spirit animal for example like you say. And you talk about the spirit animals, all of us, and you talk, you talk about the messiness of of things. You don't, you don't flatten it. I, I really, I really love that you did not do that. And I was wondering if that was intentional. It just yeah. seems like, like you, that's not the way you look at the world. So not, it's not, like, and and it's weird. I, uh, before my parents stopped talking to me, I, I did a, a therapy session with them. I brought them to. Was this? Would you say, if you don't mind me asking? What's that? Say it again. How long ago was that? If you don't mind. Oh, me it was uh, about three years ago, maybe two two years ago. That was our la my last attempt. I was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna buy us a a family therapy package, and we're gonna try to work it out. You know what I'm saying? And um, I I said to my stepdad, I'm like, um, we're fucked up. We're all fucked up. Like everyone's fucked up. And like it was weird because that offended him so much that I would even suggest that there's even a part of him that's fucked up. And so like, that's the kind of, um, it's the worldview that, I, that we just can't get to sync up. Do you know what I'm saying? Because I feel like everyone, everyone on the planet is fucked up. And like, we just try to work with it. We just try to, you know, make it the best. But um, I don't think there's not one person on this planet who's not completely fucked up. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's what you mentioned that just to be human. I there was a moment where one of your students reaches out to you, and and yeah, I mean there's I'm not I can't even get into it, but there's a lot of moments here where your response to people was to comfort them with the fact that oh this isn't as bad as it gets. Don't don't yeah. think to survive this. It's going to actually get worse. <laughs> like it's true. Like, yeah, it's, so it's you're going to survive it. Like you were like. It's going to you actually be surprised. It gets worse than this in many ways. And for a lot of ways, you're going to feel more, but you're going to survive it and you're going to be alive. And I, so, yeah, like, that's, yeah, that's the weirdest part of being a teacher, too, is like you get a new crop of freshman students every semester. Do you know what I'm saying? And and you can just see by the way their faces look that they haven't been punched yet by life. And I'm like, it's almost, there's something depressing about it. And I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, it's it's really sad. And, and but it's also kind of beautiful. Like, oh, you're going to get so fucked up later on. <laughs> and there was, there was the, my favorite section of the book is actually kind of on this topic. It's called Bad Advice. And it's a scene where your heart's broken. This, you had a girlfriend, she left, you're just beat fucking down. And your stepdad talks to you, loves talking to you. And he comes to you. <laughs> and then at one point, he realized, like, maybe I shouldn't have done He, like, tells you how bad it is, you know, and how he had it really bad. He wanted to die. And then he's like, oh, shit, maybe. But that was my favorite because he talks about his heartbreak 
hey, there's my boy, young Ezra back there. Uh. Um, um, he talks about well, that scene was so beautiful. And I loved it precisely because that message is in there too. Like it's going to get, it's going to, it's, you're not, no, this first hit you took, that's not the worst it gets for hard. Yeah. Hit. It's yeah. going to be like, you're just, you're, you're, that's your first hit, you know, and like, and which it, it would complements the whole book because you're getting punched in the face. People are getting punched in the face by you. Like, it's like, like eventually you're literally punching and people are getting punched, but that, that first heartbreak felt like a punch to the heart. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Favorite, favorite line. I am upside down in a world of people who are right side up. You, you hark back to when you were a little boy and then later on you realize, Oh, that's why I was doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I still feel that way too. I, I don't know if you still, I don't know if you still have the rage that you had or like if you still feel like you're an odd person but i i definitely do i feel odd i feel odd when i walk into a room i feel odd when i walk into like a professional setting like i'm a college professor and i feel odd when i go to meetings and i feel odd when people talk to me and like i, I <laughs> thought good? that becoming an adult would would give me some some sort of like aura of like adulthood but i don't have it and i don't want it though that's the problem yeah, the other thing I'm is not you... a, i'm not like a serious person in some aspects you know well, you you don't fall into the you don't fall into like a standard way of sort of moving in the world, and you don't because you don't want to. I mean, but that's what made so much of the story so wild is where you go with your narrative it makes it so entertaining. But the, the, you asked me a couple of times about my rage, and I will say that a rage a rage expires. Our rage. What do you want to say? My rage is dissipated for a lot of reasons. Mm. One, I committed a lot of violence. Yeah. Not only did I rob the 30 plus banks, but, you know, I stabbed my dad, tried to kill him when I was 16 during a vicious beating. And then I went and became a man of violence, stabbing people. And I did two years of solitary confinement for investigation of violence. So, like, I was a very, I got a lot of it out. Now, when I came out, I still had intensity and I still had rage, but I had learned how to. I had changed my life. I started doing, you know, meditation and things like that. And and I worked on trying to um trying to find what triggered me and worked on those things so that when situation would come up, I wouldn't just be taken over by my rage. I would the rage would come up and I'd be like, okay, and I would dismantle it so I could like kind of I could kind of exist. The difference between the biggest difference between you and me, I'm the son of a preacher. And my dad was preaching at the pulpit all the time. He was around, we were raised around people and I have great personal skills with people. I felt comfortable. Um, I was very social growing up. I had, you know, I have a bunch of friends. I'm still friends with from elementary school and junior high where, you know, I was kind of a leader and that kind of thing. So I have social skills, but I also have like ways in which because who I became, what I became and what I've done, what I've done and, and experience on the, the way traumas landed on me and I'm fractured, fucked up after doing prison and, 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 you know, foster care, prison, psychiatric hospital, all that shit kind of fuck with me. So when I get places, people identify with me and I could talk to them, but I always feel alienated from most people. I just do. Even though I socially can get along, I feel like you guys don't get me because yeah, yeah. you get, you see this, you see a guy who can talk to you, but you don't know, I go home and I, and, and the ray I've been able to survive is one, I gained 120 pounds since I got up. <laughs> I eat the fuck out of my feelings. But the other thing is that, yeah, 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 yeah. So <laughs> you saw me when I was at your home the other day. Uh, but, uh, but the other thing is that I have committed a lot of violence on the page. You know, yeah. Tom Paul Sartre said the most freedom he ever felt was the first time he killed someone on the page. When I would go into juvenile and help those kids write, oh, they were all killers and all this stuff in the, the, the maximum security area. I tell them that and they got excited because I said, listen, man, Stephen King kills the fuck out of people. Dean Koontz, they kill the hell out of people and they get paid a lot of money. So like, instead of killing people out there, why don't you take that rage and, and hurt people on the page? And yeah. so like uh, my violence and the stories and the short stories, the, the TV that I've done, the movies, that I've, it's violent. And I get to express violence in a healthy way 
Um, and so that has helped me for the little rage that continued to kind of stay with me, but I'm less driven by it. Plus age mellows you, it mellows you, the testosterone goes down, you know, I'm not as, uh. so there's that. Um, back to your book. Oh, so, so what's great about your book is that you deal with your professional life, you deal with your family life, and by that I mean your 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 sister, your mom, your dad. Before you even get to your children, your wife. You deal with um, you deal with your uh, public life in um, you know so in, in with the um, the the anti fascist network, mm -hmm. and how you get you know you're part of that group of people, and so we see all these dynamics going on with you interacting with people at all these different levels, right? Um, and to varying degrees within them, there's dramas and tensions and whatever. And, but there's also great poignancy in some of these, you know, there's seriousness, there's humor, but there's great poignancy. And the story of Monica surprised me and mm. broke my heart. It yeah. right at the center of this piece. And the writing of that was so stellar. So tell me, I know when I wrote the most traumatic moment of my life with my brother, the trauma of our childhood, that thing, I, I edited that thing 25 times easily. And every time I was done editing, it doesn't matter if I had been working there for three and a half years and kept cleaning it and tightening it, cleaning it. Every time I'd push back, I had to cry. I would just cry. It was yeah. so, I was re-traumatized every, it was the, a central trauma of mine. Tell me about writing that kind of traumatic story. How, how did you get it's crazy. that? And it's funny because I was thinking before this this uh, event today, I was thinking like, oh, maybe I should read a section with Monica. And even thinking about reading it, I started to cry. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I, can't, I can't do that. It's just going to like take forever. And it's, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, and, and for those who haven't read the book, Monica was my sister who um, when I was 16 years old, I was like at the height of my juvenile delinquency. Um, but Monica was my little sister who like kept me grounded. You know what I mean? I had two little sisters and an older sister and they really kept it together for me. Um, even just looking at them, I'd be like, okay, I feel, I feel better. I'm not as, I'm not going to rage out right now. But, um, when I was 16, she died, she was two and a half. And that, that like, if there was one moment in my life that was like a turning point into something very dark, it was that. And so like, I mean, I could almost feel my soul breaking. I could almost feel it breaking. And so, yeah, writing that was really hard. Um, I, I, yeah, kind of like you, I just wrote it over and over. It was just like re-traumatizing. But then there was also like the part before she died that I, that I wrote when I was going out to a punk rock show. And I remember like just seeing her there and she's like, where are you going? And for me, that was like, the the best it was almost like i had her back do you know what i mean so like that's um, the, for me that's the power of writing is 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 it can you can rehash traumas and stuff but you can also like bring things back like that were joyful beautiful and, yeah and beautiful yeah so like that's why i love writing so much and, and it's it's up to you and you can you can do whatever you want in there and like if i want monica back i'll write a story about her yeah 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 oh i agree I mean, you know, when I was younger, I would write things and I wanted to unpack all the malice and aggression and rage out of a story. But the older I've gotten, I'm like, yeah, that's there. But now I want to, I want to find the whimsy and stuff. I write about my mother and my mother dying and stuff like that. But now I, I find ways to write about her without being devastated with grief, or overcome with grief when I find beautiful stories to tell. Um, and, you know, obviously I post them on Facebook and stuff like that. But yeah, man, that was, that was, that was, um, that was brilliant writing because it was very measured and also clever the way you're like, we don't know what's happening. And then you wake up and it was, it was really well, it was really well done. Um, contrast with uh, and that poignant, but then you have these great characters. There's the other thing I want to say about this book is this needs to be a movie. And I don't mean like, it's not fucking born supremacy kind of shit, but this is a great fucking independent movie that has all sorts of quirky characters show up in this thing. Like, like your boy, Ara, Ara, what was his name? Aragon? 
Oh yeah, yep. What do you guys? How do you pronounce? How did you guys? What'd you call them? Aragorn. Aragorn, yeah, Aragorn. Aragorn. I mean, you got you got these interesting characters throughout, sprinkled throughout. All obviously anti-fascist, some of them, um, you know, skateboarder. Like you have all these different things going on, um, but and then you track some of them who they became. And when you write these characters, this is the stuff that I enjoyed. It shows you writing about some serious stuff, but then these characters are so goofy. You, we get to read the humor and the. Uh, the knuckleheadedness of some of uh, these characters are trying to do really great work and really are earnest about it, but they're also kind of fucked up. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's but that's what I love about people. And 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 sometimes people it's funny, it's like really serious, like anarchists or anti-fascists will meet me in person and they'll be a little taken off guard because I'm I just joke around a lot. I'm fucking goofy. I'm you know what I mean? Like I'm not very serious all the time. Like I don't. <laughs> You know, what I, I'd rather make a joke in a lot of situations. And so, like, that's just how people are. They have all this shit going on. Like, no one's ever a serious like this or like serious that. It's just not a one track thing. So I think that's funny about about people is like, I want to see them for like the other qualities that maybe aren't so like recognizable, you know? I think you really you really honor these characters by giving them so much depth up and down the scale from, you know, idiocies to really you know, really important work they're doing or, you know, some deep loyalties they've they've exhibited and that kind of thing. I really, I love that about that. I'm going to go, I'm going to return the page here. You mentioned, I want to go back to Monica real quick. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned um, that after Monica died, the family didn't really talk about it and stuff. <laughs> and it made me wonder, again, like this is not, I feel like other people would have handled this story differently. I think that there would have been a meditation on grief in here somewhere, some writing that identified, oh, part of my rage is underwritten by grief or whatever, whatever. And, and what you have here instead is just like, you don't, you never mention the grief of the family. You just talk about the silence and the ignoring things and the moving on and so on. But when you, was that intentional as well? Not to talk, like not to make this a, a like, a, like, oh, I can now understand my my life in the past and my rage through the lens of grief. It doesn't have that self-help thing at all. Like, did you work to get that out? Or again, are we at the point where you're like, I, I don't even like care about talking like that or thinking like that? It's funny because that you said that because one of the fights with my editor was that I had to add that stuff in. And so like when I, the first draft of this book, there was nothing like, I just, I wanted to tell the story as it was like a painting and give it to the reader and have them determine everything. But she was like, you know, you have to give them something. So her idea was for me to overwrite everything and then take out what I didn't want to put in there, which was a really good plan. Great. great. I, thought, I thought it was great. Yeah. Because my, my, I'm so frightened of sentimentality in 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 writing um that like I'll, I'll go the opposite direction do you know what i mean and so like she she really helped me like kind of tweak it so that there was some like some lessons i didn't want it to be a didactic tale where no, it doesn't it's, 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 learns it's, it's, the it's, story it's, yeah there's no lesson i don't want there to be like a grand lesson i want you to be able to like take parts and be like okay i don't want there be to, to be a tidy ending but um yeah, with the grief, I just, I wanted the reader to feel some grief and like have it be a little bit unresolved. Yeah, but also you didn't tell them, hey, here's what you'd look at, interpret this thing as a thing of grief. You're like, you're not, there's none of that in there. You yeah. give us the stories and allow us to feel whatever we want to feel. You know what you said about sentimentality, the the greatest, um, the greatest um, thing, and the, well, not, not the greatest, but my favorite comment on my my memoir when it came out yeah. in 2004 um and you know it was i was lucky i it came out through harper collins so i got a lot of reviews they were able to place it in place it. <clears throat> and um was that they said it wasn't sentimental it lacked sentimentality like they yeah. appreciated that i wrote a story with, and that to me is the way as it should be i live an extremely sentimental life you know you see me yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but i in the writing I work really hard to, or certainly, you know, in my memoir, I, to eschew sentimentality uh, and, and that your book comes across like that, even Definitely. more so. 
even more so than mine. It's good to hear. Um, hey, Joe, some... I'm wondering, how would you feel if we brought in a few questions from attendees at this point? Oh, yeah. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, go for it. Uh, I'll hover. Just one more question. Um, I think one of the things I really am like about you and always was curious about personally was when I met you, you were running. You were, you were a runner. And I have a lot of friends who do that who are addicts and now they're lifting weights or like they like they do all these things with like like uh with compulsion almost like and so to read how you got into um got into the running through your you were influenced by your friend like I didn't know I didn't know that element but there's a whole thing about running in here yeah. that um I I love I love how that becomes part of your life and even all the hundred miles of running like all that so it was fascinating again like there's no there's no talk of it really as like this healing journey of it like but you but you see how this in many ways kind of saved you it yeah. didn't make everything go away but it was really helpful but it also was interesting to see how you got into it you know the transition from all the addiction the hard rough transition on this i really enjoyed that um can you talk a little bit about writing about did you feel like that was necessary to write about that part of yeah yeah that was like a huge thing for me because i was really desperate trying to get away from drugs and i i couldn't like i really couldn't and i i still i always want to hang on to this but i still remember the relationship i had to alcohol which was like better than every friend better than every family member better than you know crystal who's my wife now but who i was seeing at the time better than all of that like that's how how much i love drinking and drugs and so like that's a hard thing to compete with do you know what i mean like yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was everything to me and i remember people saying like i'm going to leave you if you don't quit drinking i'm like bye you know <laughs> like no. see you later no uh, no of course it doesn't matter to me uh so like obviously you know uh my wife was really helpful in sort of getting me to see how damaging that was and how completely just fucked up my life was. And um, I was trying so many things. I went to NA, I went to AA, and like, those weren't for me. Like, it just didn't, for me, it was like, I didn't understand it at all. Like, I couldn't, I, I didn't want to stop drinking, and but then go to meetings where everyone's just talking about drinking. Now you're like, if I'm going to drink, if I'm going to quit, I have to suffer. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is. So I, I can't just give it up. I'm like, oh, okay, now it's all leisure. You made yourself suffer. You would think I grew up as like a hardcore Christian or something with my relationship to suffering because that's what running is to me. It's like I will run until I'm nearly dead. And like that's that's when the healing is. Like when I feel like I'm going to die, but then I keep running. And I'm like, oh, I can do like a bunch of shit if I could do this. It's almost like you're trying to, it's almost like you're trying, you're like, you know, and what you, you mentioned religious, it does feel like when people are penitent in the Catholic church and they're whipping themselves. Like, yeah, that's what it God, is. I won't like, do it again. Self-flagellation. Your penitence has to include flesh being ripped off your back and shit. No, no. Like you were talking about your feet are all cut from the pounding. Anyway. All right. So let's open it up to a question. I just, I saw there were some questions here better than my question. So let's go to them. <laughs> no your questions are great and we do have uh, a bunch so I'll, I'll pull a few and we'll see how far we get um yeah so thanks everybody who's been writing out thoughts and questions um maybe just starting off with this one um uh, you know a question from uh an attendee about unexpected truths uh josh that you've kind of come across while working in the prison industrial complex like what's Oof. Yeah, what's been surprising or, or unexpected for you? And Not maybe gonna... maybe you should, I don't know if you've actually said in this conversation yet what your work in the prison system has been. Yeah, um, so I, yeah, I teach, I teach writing uh, at Mule Creek State Prison. Um, and I've been there since 2018. It's, uh, I still teach at the community college, uh, but our community college has gone into the prison system. So I got the opportunity to um, teach half of my classes in the prison. Uh, so I kind of knew what the deal was with prison. I've studied prison a lot and I've, I've read a lot about prison. Um, I've spent time in jail. So like, I understand what happens, but I knew that there was a lot of like 
brilliance in there. And I knew there was a lot of, um, you know, it's, it's, it's based upon oppression and it's, it's really, uh, it's a really sick system. And so I knew all that, like theoretically, right. But then um, when I started teaching in there, everything is magnified by a thousand. And so I, I kind of like, just the the brilliant students I had and I'm not just I'm talking about like some of, and, and I wrote about this in the book like my the first student I met was a Nazi lowrider and like you know he'd left the gang but he was still was just tatted up from head to toe but that dude was brilliant and he could write and he had soul when he wrote and he didn't hold back when he wrote and it was a shame that he's still locked away um, and, and, and just student after student like that and the way the guards treat them is so inhumane and like there are little things they could do to treat them like human beings and still be doing their job or whatever, but they don't do that. It's like this game of humiliation and, um, they treat me like that too. So, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, it's, it, it's, it's really eye opening to go in there and just see how much talent there is in there how much hope they have. Um, even the lifers have a bunch of hope and they're taking college classes, even though they have life in prison. Um, yeah, it's, it's really sad and heartbreaking and joyful and beautiful and all those things. And Joe, feel free if there's anything you want to jump in on, even if these questions are directed at Josh, happy to hear your insights too. I want to disagree with John. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to eat my banana then. Fuck this. Fuck this interview. Josh and I were talking earlier and he said the exact opposite. No, okay. <laughs> anyway, go on. Cool. Yeah. Another another good question here about um, the response from fellow faculty, uh, how you feel about uh, fellow faculty reading your book. And, uh, and and just generally what's motivated you to continue um, working uh, with FLC despite everything yeah that's a good question yeah yeah um uh, damn I, i've had a lot of faculty contact me and just be like this this book blew me away um i think one of the things that saves me a little bit is that i'm harder on myself than i am on anyone else in the book <laughs> do you know what i mean so like it's not like i'm just i'm presented as some hero heroic figure in this book like it's very clear from the beginning i'm a piece of shit and I'm trying to not be a piece of shit, but like you also uh, say stuff like that real quick. I want to jump in. You even yeah, say yeah. the book stuff like, um, "Don't look to me like I'm a hero. I'm not a hero. You know that I'm not that person." Like to people, mm -hmm. you just say that, or like, yeah, you have those thoughts throughout it. We definitely are not pr propping yourself up as that. But go on. Yeah, um, but no, I, I haven't had any negative, negative anything yet. But I'm sure I will at some point. Um, my when my editor, the first editor, wrote it. Amy, she she was really cool. She was such a good editor. Uh, and she uh, she's like, a lot of people are going to hate you after reading this book. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, was I was braced. I was like ready. I was training extra. I was like, <laughs> fight them off in the streets and shit. But like, it's a little disappointing when no one like tries to fuck with you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but that really, I mean, that touches on a thing like one of the, I think the thing that turns people off the most when when they hear you're like an anti-racist or something, there's like this assumption of like sanctimoniousness, you know, mm -hmm. that like goes yeah, along with point. like kind of this idea of like what the left is. And I think it really catches people off guard when when you're not that. <laughs> um, yeah, so. for sure. It's funny, you know, um, I think uh, one of the I, I was, when I was getting the blurbs for the book, just for the book jacket and everything. uh there was one like famous anarchist who who uh who's who's like I, he rejected the blurb he's like fuck this book i don't want to hear another um like antifa war story book and he didn't read it but like that's not what it is dang but, name know, names we had need to know <laughs> no because i want to do i want to do an event with this fool oh, okay all right <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Good. But uh, no, but I get it. Like, I understood where he's coming from. Cause like, like when I heard it, I'm like, yeah, I could see that. I could see that. Like no, no harm. Yeah. But without done. even reading the book, <laughs> come on. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I know, but you know, he would mistake like it. it for that. You could see how like, he would, he would mistake it for that. Look at that. Cover. I mean, it's kind of like, 
if you have an idea in your head and you see this cover, you're like, oh, here we go. This dude and his bat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> brag about how he did this and that. Yeah, yeah. yeah this not dude that not that Smacking yeah. Nazis around. <laughs> cool. Well, on a totally different track, um, somebody's asking about your relationship with poetry. And I, I failed mm -hmm. to mention in my introduction that this is not your first book, right? You mm -hmm. previously published uh, a poetry collection. Yeah. Um, so I uh, would love to hear a little bit about um, the role of poetry in your life. Uh, and and this question also from Jen, uh, who asks about the consciousness shift that it took to go from writing poetry to memoir. Although I would uh, say your, your memoir is very poetic. Thank you. Yeah, that was one of my worries. And this is Jen. Jen let me tell you about Jen. Jen was in my three person writing group who we just workshopped this together for, we've been in our writing group for, um, what is it, three years now or something? Um, so like she saw this book from like its little baby stage. But um, yes, poetry is everything to me. I, that's That was my first love really is poetry. Um, I just, I love, even when I was little, I love the way words sound when they're coming out of my face. So like that to me is, I ever since I was little, I just like the configuration of words and and what they mean when when they have different sounds. Um, and that was my huge worry when I was writing this memoir. I was like, ah, is it is it going to be poetic enough? Is there enough poetry in there? Like, am am I getting the right sounds? Um, do the sounds make sense with the narrative and things like that? And so, like, when I sent it to the first editor, I was really embarrassed because I'm like, I don't know if this is one of those like dumb memoirs that's just narrative and plot and like has no poetry within it um but she she squashed that worry right away so um yeah like that that's the way i write though i write poetry first and then i'll like smash it into a narrative so yeah poetry is my first love and and that's that's the way i write i felt like i felt like i felt like you were writing to um almost kind of writing a dead white guy so <laughs> like i felt like you you're you're you were in conversation with bukowski mm. like bukowski in his letters you know he had he had great poetry but his letters were very fascinating they yeah. weren't exactly poetry but they they fucking sang and they were dark and they were squalid and um i felt like your book is a conversation like that's that that's person so would get that vibe like, it's funny that you say that because um, when I first showed up at UC Davis to study poetry writing, I was like, I, you know, I was young and I was like, I probably thought I was Charles Bukowski in a, in a way. I was like, you know, like I'm sure every like little, you know, there's this stage where you go through where you're like, oh, I'm a gruff barroom brawler or whatever. And like I, uh, I show up and I wrote this poem. And the professor was Joe Winderoth. And like his his uh his note to me was like, You're not Bukowski. <laughs> that was it. And it fucking crushed my soul. Like you could see the soul leaving my body. <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna quit this forever. I'm not a writer. I'm gonna go, you know, work in the uh whatever. Oh, it was the worst. But like I I felt that. I felt it and I took it with me. And I'm like, ever everything every time I sit down to write, I'm like, you're not fucking Bukowski, dude. Yeah, but nonetheless, because you have so much Bukowski in you and because you're dealing with with um you know squalid topics, it 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 it, it dances with that, it has that feel, it has poetry in it. Like yeah. his like just like his letters. You can't not have poetry in here. That's what you are. You're a poet. Yeah. yeah. Well, and speaking of of that, I guess, um, or kind of picking up off of that, we've got another question just about aspiring writers. Um, someone wants to know whether or not you would recommend uh, an aspiring writer uh, take a class, take your class, for example, um, or to just stay the hell away from academia and try and preserve <laughs> some sense of raw authenticity. Um, and I, I know you talk a lot about the type of students that you you get along best with, um, you know, the ones who show up and 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 don't think that they can write at all versus the ones who are convinced that they're born to write. What kind of advice would you give to someone who is born to write? I mean, I'd be a fool if I said to stay away from academia because academia really gave me a lot. 
it really did and and so like i you know and even if it's not like oh you're gonna learn to be a great writer in college you're just gonna meet a lot of like-minded people and that's kind of what happened with me is i met a lot of like-minded people some of them are on this call right now um who you know they they're same same writing mind and like that really helped me um i met a lot of a lot of connections there who who i stayed in contact with um and to be around writers and to be around people who care about the shit you care about whether it's writing anti-fascism anti-racism um organizing all of that like you have to be where they are do you know what i mean and 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 it helps so if you want to be a writer you got to be around other writers and you got to write like uh my professor, my my mentor at uh, Sac State, he's like, you're not you're not a writer unless you're actually writing. If you're sitting down to write, you're a writer. And so like you just have to do it. But for me, it helped to like be around people who had the same kind of mindset. I'm, you're talking to someone who's never taken a writing class in his life, so I don't. I like literally have not. But I'm a reader. Really, be someone, Joe. If you, you could, <laughs> if you took a writing class. <laughs> yeah, no, I never took I never took the right. I didn't take college or nothing. But the thing about it is that um, but I was a reader and I and I'm I'm I, I say you want to be a good writer, be a good reader. And so um I and it's not just because I haven't taken a writing class, isn't to say I haven't put in the hours of really studying writing for other great writers. I used to in prison used to write every, I would read like magazines and books and I would write their words and copy them down just to follow like the way the the the, the propulsion of their sentences. Um, you know, that kind of thing, following their thoughts. Yeah. I got a lot of words of a great writers in me and a lot of syntax and paragraphs and great sentences. So um, I did study writing, but in my, but my, my own way. But what I want to say about, about schooling and academia is I'm not shitting on it. What I want to say is that when you do, when you are in that setting, what I've learned from a lot of friends who've been there is you get to choose what you need to, to, to learn. Like they'll give you a lot, and some of it you'll be like, yeah, whatever. And it goes in, out, whatever. But you are going to hear something and be like, oh, that's what's that's necessary. I need that. Or I need that. That's going to help me because yeah. different teachers will open up different parts of you and help you and, and you'll learn things along the way. But yeah, um, I don't, I think people who can get an education right and writing, you know, especially if you can get, yeah, there's, you know, yeah, please. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. So we've got a bunch of questions that are kind of similar that I'm going to try and kind of like weave together here um, before maybe asking y'all each kind of a final question to end us out tonight. So th there's kind of this common theme. Your book hasn't been out that long, but a lot of folks in the Q&A are asking about um, responses to the book from administrators, maybe folks who are part of the story. Um, somebody's asking about any like repercussions that you've faced Legal um, repercussions. and then and then another person asking about if you have any regrets about anything that are in the book um, uh, or any concerns about any of the the ways in which you are vulnerable in your writing um, no I've, I've I've been writing like this for a long time and like um, the response I get from from people when they read my writing is like it's so raw and like uh you know I, it's really relatable and and like sometimes when i write about the most disgusting aspects of myself that's when people contact me and they're like i understand that do yep. you know what i mean and so and so like i really like to talk about these really dark parts of myself that I don't quite understand and I'm writing to maybe understand them a little better and I'm just putting that out there and and like I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it and I don't think it's not embarrassing to me it's not I don't think it's shameful I think we all have these weird parts that maybe society tells us not to talk about but I don't care I'm gonna talk about them anyway when I wrote my memoir, I didn't have a child yet. When you wrote yours, you had children. Yeah. So did you think about one of the questions was something like, what do you think about your children growing up and reading this story? Were you thinking about that at all when you were writing it? No, because I tell, like, we talk about everything in my house. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, we're very, like, open. That's what I saw. That's what I felt. Yeah. 
we're open people and we love to like, I talk about my failures to my kids and, and like, for me, failure was a big part of my life. And like, I wouldn't be this person I am today without just being a colossal failure early on. <laughs> <laughs> so like, uh, yeah, I think it's- I limped think it's, from one failure to the next failure. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then now that I'm older, it feels a little better. Like I feel better. I, like I've learned, I've built a platform, I can stand on it. Uh, I can move around. I'm comfortable and like things are good now, but um, it wasn't always good. And it was, it wasn't because I was successful. Yeah. yeah and you got to trust kids too. You know, you, you like, yes. you got to trust that you can be honest with them and that they can learn from your mistakes and hopefully not do all the same shit. Exactly. Yeah. And maybe do some of it and, and then be okay. <laughs> be okay with it. Know that they're going to be loved. You know, yeah. when my, when my daughter was born, I realized, Oh shit, she's going to read my, like, she's going to know about me. And, you know, there's, there's the documentaries, there's the the TV shows, there's the whatever, whatever. So I was like, okay, she's going to know. Um, so what, when she was very little, whenever there was a, there was Niho Kailan, or it was like, um, uh, what was that big headed kid in Canada? They little, uh, started with Caillou. Like, didn't matter what little TV show it was for little kids. I would always want to point out the message of the kid who got alienated from everyone and then worked their way back and everyone took them in and that became, you know, friend, friends again. Like yeah. I always pushed that narrative because eventually that was the narrative that I wanted her to be very strong, have strong feelings about. Like sometimes you fuck up and you know, you get right and you're welcome back and everything can work out if you do that. Cause that's, she was going to have to learn that about me. And at age seven, I, you know, she asked me, she started asking me questions that were weird. Like, have you, do you know anybody who robbed any banks? Like I was like, oh <laughs> shit, I think he started to pick up things in the site guys or something. I was like, yeah, I knew a guy who robbed the bank once. And you know, you know it wasn't me. I was talking about a friend of mine who was a bank, another bank robber. But like, so I felt like it was this time where I had to, I had to like, I had to start telling her. So she was really cool when, when I broke the you know, news to her. But yeah, so I prepared her, I prepared her heart and her imagination to to accept the story about redemption, the redemption arc, you know, bringing your, like being accepted back in a society and trying to get along instead of trying to stab everyone. <laughs> or shit. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's my answer. Cool. So we are closing in on the end of our time together. It's been great. Um, I am wondering if either of y'all have final thoughts or anything you're working on um, now or want to work on in the future that you'd like to share. Oh, man, I, I'm working on a, I'm writing a fiction book now about a little Mexican kid. Who well, you're just up. trying to do every genre. You're like poetry, exactly. memoir, yeah, yeah, fiction. Yeah. I want to put the next one. Uh, this, yeah, this, I'm trying to, it's about a flying Mexican boy. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Of course indeed uh but yeah i'm just trying to write i'm just trying to keep writing and and keep teaching and and um you know be in the classroom with my students and uh be at the prison with my students and yeah right right now i feel like i got some good shit going so i'm not gonna fuck it up <laughs> i'm trying to stay out of jail not go to <laughs> do all the right things be a good citizen of the country I do. For, I have I have projects I'm working on, but I I, I want to eventually figure out a, some a project to do me and Josh. That would be exciting. I don't know what it is yet. But Let's go rob some banks. Okay, that that's now you're talking cliche. I already that's done. I already did that shit. I'm tired. That's old hat, man. Let's do something new. Let's All rob right. tech bros. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean something, some sort of creative project. Um, yeah, let's do it. And uh, I think it, it might, yeah, we'll see, but we'll, we'll figure it out. But this has been great. Thank you for having us. Thank you for hosting. Yeah, this. thanks, Liberty. Been this awesome. was so fun. I hope that, yeah, y'all yeah, are awesome. Um, I really just cannot say enough. Pick up these books. Uh, you know, go go to Joe's site, order his book, grab a copy of uh, the Hands of Crafted the Bomb. You can get it from us. You can get it from our friends at PM Press. You can get it at your local anarchist bookstore. Um, but uh, y'all. I hope you have a great night. Thanks to everybody who submitted questions. We didn't quite get to every single one, so I apologize to anyone we missed. Uh, we could have kept going, but I hope everybody has a good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Take care, y'all. Thanks again.